Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, balance, um, and I'm going to um, try and explain a little bit how I got involved in balance research because I really wasn't interested in it uh, when I started out after my PhD, uh, but came to it. So um, I need to give you some theory because uh, otherwise some of the stuff I'll talk to you won't really make a lot of sense. So try and bear with me. I'll, there's a minimum of equations. Uh, there will just be a short quiz before we move on. Make sure we get the concepts. Uh, and then there's actually some some uh, uh, controversies, controversies here, and um, I'll touch on those. And they, and one of which led me to kind of where I am today. And this is where I will uh, tell you a little bit about what I've been doing in the very recent past and uh, what I hope to do in the future in this particular area amongst many other areas. I can tell you right now that the, the Motion Analysis Research Center is, is, uh, is, is full of ideas and uh, you'll see a lot of, just, you know, watch this space, I think it's going to become very, very busy. There are a lot of different types of research. But some of the stuff will be about balance and it will involve me. So, my background. Um, <laughs> Because I really do, uh, from the perspective of a lot of people, have a very strange background. But uh, my first degree was in physical education. Um, and in my third and fourth years, I did first a course on, on basically biomechanics. Then I did a, you know, you sort of honors project. Uh, and I realized that biomechanics was it for me, and I wasn't going to be among the other 250 of my classmates and go off and teach uh, physical education. I didn't really like kids very much in those days. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the truth. I didn't know what I, you know, I didn't know. Why are you still there? Well, why would I want to do that? So, uh, hi there. Hi, welcome. Um, and of course, biomechanics, and this was in the late, late 1970s, and you may not know much about biomechanics, but it really was all really driven by sport research. I mean, people were very interested in how to make Olympic athletes better, uh, and a lot of other things. And, and the clinical side was kind of there, but it really wasn't, uh, it wasn't funded. It wasn't, there wasn't a lot of activity going on. So I was interested in sport. And then I went on to do my master's uh, in, uh, in human kinetics, also focusing on biomechanics. And, during this time, I, uh, uh, to, to, keep, to kind of get money to, to you know, afford my lifestyle, my extravagant lifestyle as a graduate student, I uh, was lucky to work on a, on, a, on a Summer Canada, on a couple of years of a Summer Canada grant that was given to a local disabled sports club. Um, and so I worked with d disabled athletes. And, and uh, going back to my first comment about not liking you know, people younger than me, this was really an eye-opening experience because not only were these, these kids younger than me and I was trying to train them you know, to swim and to, and to run and shot put and all that, but in some cases we traveled with them to meets in, uh, in say, Michigan and other places nearby, and these kids needed full care. I mean, toileting care, dressing care, I mean, everything. And, you know, like we talked about throwing myself into the deep end, but I loved it. And so I began to think more and focus of... Uh, from sport itself to looking at disabilities, looking at rehab. Uh, and then I went on to do my PhD at, at the University of Waterloo, uh, where I worked uh, under Professor David Winters, whose name may or may not ring a bell with people, but was uh, probably one of the preeminent uh, uh, biomechanics people in the world uh, up until his, his passing about, uh, just about two years ago now. So, um, my dissertation at that time, I was interested in motor, the motor uh, sensory uh, kind of interactions and so it was the role of vision in human walk and human locomotion. So, my first posting was in Australia at what was then called Cumberland College of Health Sciences, now University of Sydney. Um, and um, there I taught PTs, OTs, nurses, uh, um, and, um, and I continued to be more involved in human motion, but as it sort of uh, mixed with uh, rehabilitation and with clinical, more clinical biomechanics, um, primarily related to gait. So, so I, I trained at Waterloo about a gait analysis. Dr. Winter was a, a world-renowned expert in gait analysis. And so everything was about gait. I did other things. I supervised projects and other sort of sport physiotherapy type uh, projects, but really of my own interest were on gait, amputee gait, and various other forms of gait. Uh, and then at some further point in my career, I worked at a spinal cord injuries rehab center in, in Toronto called Ventures Hospital. Um, and I started this biomechanics interest group, and we would hold meetings there. And the first person I tapped to come in as a guest speaker was, of course, my old supervisor, uh, David Winter. And uh, so this was 
Uh, just before one of his last books came out, which is called ABC, that is Anatomy, Biomechanics, and Control of Balance, during standing and walking. And so Dave was all excited about, about balance, and I, I'd never really considered it before because I thought, like a lot of people, well, balance seems you know, pretty straightforward. I mean, it's pretty simple. It's not nearly, it's not sexy enough for me at, at that time. But hearing him talk and, and beginning to look into the area, I found that there, there was just a, a wealth of, of things to study and understand and, and, and look at in balance. And so for the past, I hate to admit it, it's almost 18 years now, I've been, in addition to still showing interest in, in gait and sport related things and in my CVs all over the map, uh, I've really been quite focused on, on balance in a certain sense, as focused as I ever get. Okay, so balance, again, like I said, seems very simple. Uh, uh, doesn't seem particularly, you know, ballistic, doesn't seem very dynamic. Uh, you simply are standing. And you can do that as early as six months of age, and you continue to do it for the rest of your life, hopefully successfully. But actually, it's very, it's quite com complex. It's much, much more complex than we might first realize. Because we've got this uh, human, which is basically uh, uh, about two-thirds of our total mass can be seem to be located about two-thirds of our height off the ground. Um, and so, and we also have a relatively small base of support, uh, which means um, that any time our center of mass, if we think of our center of mass, think of sort of the middle of your pelvis, any time that kind of moves too far to the right or left, too far back or too far forward, then, then we're, in, we're in danger of, of, of falling. And so any motion away from that complete vertical position above the feet uh, will, will in fact produce what's called a torque or a moment of force, uh, typically about the ankles. And so because of that, uh, or that can be the hips, in some cases when there's a very large perturbation, you'll, you'll actually employ some motion of the hip. So it means that we have to have some kind of an active control system to constantly be monitoring this and correcting this to allow us to, to just stand. It's not something that we can, uh, like we're not like a, you know, a, a, a quadruped, like a turtle or something, I and mean, the turtle can just sort of go to sleep standing up. Or I think horses sleep standing up, don't they? I mean, cows. Uh, cows or whatever, I don't know. And it's all fun to, yeah. to push them over. It's fun in games until someone gets hurt, right? So, so this is kind of like the, the, the theoretical model, okay? So we've got, uh, we've got some uh, point here, probably the ankle. Uh, we've got some mass, and we've got some, some motion of that mass away from this pure ver vertical position. And so the, the gravity acts on, on the mass of our trunk and arms and heads, uh, head and so forth, and it, it causes um, then us to have what's called this sort of torque, this sort of turning force happening at the ankles. Okay, so, um, hang on. So if we think of a pendulum, which is kind of like us, but only upside down, uh, here we have this thing called the fulcrum. So it's attached to this point, and here's this mass. And the, the, the uh, pendulum is inherently very stable because gravity acting on the mass is continually trying to bring the mass to the middle position. So it's always trying to, to bring it back to the position. As soon as the mass exceeds that point, gravity will, will, will bridge us, bring it back. So a pendulum is very uh, stable. Humans being this sort of inverted pendulum, as it's called, are inherently unstable, okay, because any kind of motion away from the midline will, will cause this torque, and we have to do something to overcome that. Otherwise, gravity wins and we fall down. Okay, so how do we control it? Well, we, we, we have sensory inputs like vision, vestibular, and somatosensory that are telling us what's happening with us within, within this gravitational field. Uh, we also have motor outputs, so we can, we can uh, voluntarily uh, uh, ask our muscles to do something to, uh, to alter this, uh, this motion. And there are also some reflexes that are built in that, that happen without conscious control. So vision, uh, it's probably, uh, it's used pr primarily for uh, uh, planning of our, of our movements, so it's sort of a, what I call a feed forward uh, situation. And then we also have, um, uh, you know, we also use it to avoid obstacles, to negotiate our, our, the, the, the route where we plan through the 
space and so forth. Uh, it's actually the, our dominant sense in, in terms of balance, um, and I think we've all been fooled by our vision in different situations. We're sitting at a, at a red light, and for some reason a car beside us begins to move, and we hit the brake even harder thinking we're moving. It. So the vision can be fooled relatively easily, but it's because it's the dominant sense, uh, our vestibular then, it basically senses linear and angular accelerations, primarily of the head, and also senses the vertical direction. Uh, but it also can be uh, neutralized relatively easily, just if you're standing, um, just if you tilt your head back, it, it uh, kind of uh, distorts the information coming from it. So it can be fooled very easily. And finally, somatosensory includes uh, a whole array of things that tell us about uh, our joint position, uh, pressure under our feet, uh, and so forth, that, that we also can then bring into this, uh, uh, bring into our somatic, uh, uh, our sensory motor our cortex. So we have a richness of information coming in. Hi, hi, yes? Oh, just waving. You cannot hear? Can you not hear? We cannot see. Wave it down, my guy. They want to Can't hear? hear? Oh, they cannot hear? I don't think they not hear? Not hear? Yeah, they cannot hear. Oh. Are they muted? I don't know. Turn up the volume. Oh, oh, oh. She's going to write you a note. Write us a message. Maybe it's them. We thought it was a different topic. <laughs> <laughs> and we would like to sneak out without offending him. We can't see. They can't we see. Can't see. Can you oh. hear us? Yeah, now we can hear them. We hear you. We hear you. Can you hear us? Your volume is down. How do we tell them that? Really? I can Okay. Um, so what do we measure when we talk about balance and posture? And by the way, uh, these, these are two terms that are sometimes used interchangeably. And uh, in fact, um, according to Winter anyway, uh, posture is a static uh, measure. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reflection of the alignment of the body segments with respect to the vertical. Uh, balance is the idea of, of moving the, the body back into vertical alignment. Okay, uh, that's probably a moot point here. Uh, so so we, we, we deal with uh, the concepts of the center of mass. So this is a theoretical point of where it can represent all the mass of your body, and it's, a, and it's in position based on your, your segments and your, and your posture, basically. Uh, the center of gravity, uh, which is a slightly different concept, um, and that is, center of mass is this theoretical point. It sits in three-dimensional space. As I said, in normal standing, it's somewhere in the middle of your pelvis. The center of gravity is if you just projected that to the floor. So the center of mass is, is three-dimensional, three the center of gravity is two-dimensional. Uh, it only exists on the surface of the, of the base of support, okay? And then the center of pressure. The center of pressure, then, is the one point that represents all of the ground reaction forces under your feet. Okay, so you're going to have, so what, what we're really interested then is really looking at how the center of gravity and the center of pressure interact with each other. And that's what, that's what helps us maintain our balance. Uh, and, but it is actually independent of the two. And sometimes in some of the papers you find uh, that center of gravity and center of pressure are, are even confused. But uh, in, a, in, a, in an engineering point of view, uh, this is the controller. This is what controls. And this is the control. This is what is controlled. So the center of pressure controls the center of gravity. Just to be pedantic. Okay. Here's our drawing again. And the last thing we're, we're interested in, I've already mentioned, this idea of a moment of force, which is sometimes called a torque. There are a few purists out here that would, that would argue that, you, that they're not the same, but for all intents and purposes they are. And that just basically means that uh, the, the force acting uh, through uh, an axis uh, causing rotation, basically. So those are the kinds of concepts that we need to be sort of aware of when we talk about balance. And finally, we have uh, another important concept, which is the base of support. Uh, and, and here we can see, uh, some, sometimes it's, uh, you have a wide base or, or a narrow, sometimes you have tandem, uh, standing with one foot in front of the other, uh, stands with crutches and canes and so forth. So there's all different kinds of bases of support. Call me. 
after. Right. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, now, other factors: the height of the center of mass. So, a stable system has mass very low. So, the lower the mass, the more stable it is. So, humans right away are a little bit more unstable because their mass is so high. Um, the relationship of the center of gravity, we want to keep it well within the base of support. That's, uh, again, more mass is more stable. So you could use that as an excuse for putting on a little extra holiday weight. I just want to be more stable. Can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Is that entirely true? I mean, if, if you actually added a whole bunch of weight to the center of the well, yeah, no, no, okay. no. Trust me, it's not, it's not, yeah, you have to consider Sorry. both things together. Sorry. However, adding weight to your ankles would make you more stable. So it does matter. It's a shame that we don't put on weight on our ankles, right? <laughs> uh, friction. Well, we don't generally put it on our heads either. So. Yeah, no, well, that's true. Although, some people, you wonder, right? So, uh, friction, of course, if we're on a very slippery surface, the, the, you know, the changes the game a bit. Uh, how our segments are aligned, uh, and also whether our sensory inputs are, are intact and fully functional. No, no, we've already mentioned the three of them. And other, uh, and so these are all different factors. So right away, I think, I hope you're getting the idea that there's a whole lot going on here. Uh, um, and uh, hence the, the answer to my question at the start may become obvious as we go along. Um, and then of course, uh, mental status may play a role. Um, how your muscles are activating. So we're talking about our postural muscles, which are often slow twitch and fatigue resistance. So their, their pur purpose is to, is to prevent the, the skeleton from collapsing <coughs> and to keep the alignment, of, of get the postural alignment. Then we also use some muscles phasically, so they are more fast twitch uh, fibers generally, and they're used to make corrections or to initiate mo uh, movement and so forth. And there may be other physiological or even pathological factors. So it's quite a complex kind of matrix of things that we need to consider. So how do we test this? Well, quiet stance is a very popular model. It's uh, certainly most of my bright balance research is involved with so-called quiet stance. And that's basically just standing quietly. Uh, and so we can look at how do we maintain this so-called static uh, stability. Uh, we can look at also uh, externally perturbed uh, uh, stance. So in some in some uh, way, we would we would uh, perturb the subject. We would, we would catch them off guard. Is that a question? No, I wasn't it. Oh no, I meant to stop you. No, I no, I'm just contemplating. <laughs> He's using basic basic muscles. Yeah. Uh, and so this is looking at, at mechanisms by which you you sort of regain this dy dynamic stability. Uh, and then there's also self perturb. You can. You, you know, if it's not maybe ethical or you're concerned about actually pushing people or pulling them or dropping them or whatever, then you can actually get them to perturb their own stance in some, some ways. Very simple ways, including just raising their arm as a type of self-perturbed uh, self, uh, stance. And again, to look at how, how we maintain our dynamic stability. So one of the concepts that really plays an important role here is this concept of postural sway. Uh, and that just basically means that because we're in an inverted pendulum uh, kind of uh, uh, scenario, uh, alignment, and because we have this dynamic active control system, we are actually you know, moving all the time in, in fairly small magnitudes. And so we sway back and forth and to a certain extent from left to right all the time, uh, generally pivoting about our ankles. Now there's some research that actually shows that there's motion at, at all of the lower extremity joints, but it's, it's really quite small. For all intents and purposes, we can treat the body like a single rigid body uh, uh, with, an, with one axis at the ankle. So anterior posterior sway, uh, it's, it's in the sagittal plane, it's generally somewhere between 5 to 7 millimeters at the level of the center of mass, so, so not, not huge amounts of motion. Um, medial lateral sway is uh, uh, about 60% of that in the right to left in young adults. Uh, and so, with the inverted pendulum uh, model, we've already discussed this, the redundant sort of that. Uh, this is the math, just copy that down, there'll be a test at the end. But basically, <laughs> it's saying that if you take the ground reaction force vector here and measure how far it is from the ankle, that's one torque acting. And if we look at the weight force, and again measure where it is relative to the ankle, that's the, that's the other. 
uh, torque. And for us to stand still, uh, the, the two torques should be equal. But since we're always moving, the two torques are constantly uh, changing, right? So that's what, that's what we measure in the lab, these, these, these torques, among other things. And of course, we assume that uh, these two are equal, and they should be. The uh, body sways about the ankles only. As I said, some research suggests that perhaps it's not, um, and that it, the ankle acts like a hinge joint, and I think our podiatry people will tell us that that's not necessarily true either. But in these small uh, displacements, angular displacements, it's probably a reasonable assumption. <clears throat> okay, so it's all about the relationship of the center of gravity and center of pressure. Uh, so if the center of pressure, okay, so the center of pressure, if it moves in front of the center of gravity, then the torque will, will be such that it will tend to push us backwards. If the center of pressure is behind the center of mass, it'll push us forwards. So there's this, this constant kind of, um, you know, think of a sheep dog kind of herding um, uh, sheep. And of course the dog runs ahead of the sheep to get them to go one direction and if they go a little too far it'll come around the other side. But it's very much, the, the sheep dog here is the center of pressure by the way. And the sheep are the center, center of gravity. The controller and the controlled, right? <clears throat> so this is a little diagram from David Leonard's textbook and it just shows one one sway cycle uh, of swaying forward and swaying back, which would happen maybe hundreds of times while you're standing. Uh, I won't go into it in great detail, other than to say um, that here we have this ground reaction force. So this is the, the what's controlling it, and it's now behind. It's behind the center of mass, so it's tending to make this rotation go in this direction. So we have some velocity and we have some acceleration. Uh, through some mechanism, we sense that, and we and we deliberately move our center of pressure forward ahead of the center of mass. To, otherwise, if we don't do anything, we're going to fall over. So that's why this represents we're still moving forward, but now because it's moved ahead, we're applying an acceleration to try and stop that. So that's why they're in opposite directions. Eventually, we will apply enough of a torque that we will stop the forward motion, and then backward motion will begin. And we sense that's happening, and we then move our center of pressure backwards to try and capture that. Yeah, Mark? Uh, eventually, like the milliseconds, right? I mean, this is happening. Well, I'll explain to you just what, my, what I, but some people believe is going on here. Eventually, that's, that's a very good question. You just mark that one down. I'm, I'm going to give you a gold star for that Thank one. You. <laughs> and he's a librarian, folks. Yes. Really, you guys should have been sharper. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> And I'm I'm just, and, the yeah, well, I'm so it just kind of repeats itself until you get out to the other side and then it comes back and this sway goes on. So the center of pressure is moving uh, in the AP direction and to a certain extent in the ML direction, always trying to get itself ahead of the center of gravity and then if it goes too far, then it's got to come around and bring it back the other way. And this is constantly going on. Okay, so, so a lot of people have studied that. Uh, and so there's been lots of uh, uh, people trying to answer that you know, very question, like, you know, how, how, how can we do that? Like, you know, how, what, what kind of mechanism prevents us from going too far or failing to, to, to uh, detect what's happening and so forth? And so they looked at whether it's um, uh, reactive stuff going on, reflexes and other, other passive me mechanisms, or whether it's uh, proactive, whether we're actually generating some kind of a motor program and so forth. So there's been all kinds of research of that. And, it's, and from that, from the 1970s onward, uh, we have uh, that there's an ankle strategy under normal conditions, and if perturbations become too large, then we employ a hips strategy. And it's been very popular to do that. We have a machine, soon to be in the lab, that was built around the, the premises and the experimental work by the founder of some of this stuff, Luke Nashner. And uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that research, I just don't know if that's the whole picture. So uh, you can be, uh, things that might not affect your ability to do this include age, uh, whether uh, fatigue plays a role, whether you're injured, whether or not you're wearing some kind of bracing, AFOs and so forth, uh, it's really difficult to, to check, especially backwards sway. Um, obesity plays a role, uh, and how stable the environment you're in, whether you're standing on the BART train or on the back of a pickup, or whether you're standing in the classroom. Hi. I was just curious about the, the other alternatives in addition to ankle and hip 
different strategies and wondering if there's much evidence on um, cervical spine, little minute postural adjustments at that level to adjust small magnitude of back and forth. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it wouldn't surprise me if there, if there is research that shows there is some of that going on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, Faye Horak is one name that comes to mind. I've done a lot. Uh, uh, Marjorie Willicott, Lou Nashner, and, uh, and, and uh, someone black, someone just really in black as well, I think. There's, there's, a, there's a handful of people who really are quite well known in this area. I mean, soon to be spatted by the name. I ask because in the post whiplash population, there's a lot of push to test balance and test balance. Oh, all right. And, so I wonder if there's a mechanism behind that, that why is balance a deficit so commonly post a flash or post cervical injury? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm almost certain it has something to do with pathways and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so externally perturbed balance. We'll go through this a little quicker, but it's probably not the, probably that particular interest. But so there's some way of, of perturbing it. Um, and uh, our, our equipment in the lab, soon to be in the lab, is, is this balance master. And what it does, among other things, is it actually uh, will shift the platform that you're standing on, uh, forward or backwards. Does it? Yeah, okay. I know ours do. I haven't seen this one yet. But, so it goes back and forth. So that, we can actually test small and big, yeah, and it also tilts, and it's really quite extensive. So we, we, can, we can look at some of this uh, horizontal translations, uh, the sagittal plane, uh, and, and we can also change the surround. We can actually fool the visual system, for instance. So lots of things we can do to kind of uh, look at this. So naturally at the first thing. So on. That's really not bad. Yeah. He, he talks about center of mass, but he didn't measure it. He actually measured center of pressure, but I mean, it was 1970s and nobody was looking. So, uh, so and he, he found that there's a bottom much up sequencing of the muscles. So the response starts at the ankle muscles and, and works its way up, <clears throat> which kind of makes sense. Uh, dynamic balance, uh, so self perturbation, standing. Um, you get with, with supports and without supports in the change of a base of support, wide leg, narrow, tandem, single leg, um, and uh, moving arms and things. There's lots of different self perturbations that's been done over the years. And closing the eyes being one very simple one that you can try. And I had to close my eyes and when you were testing me in that little thing in the lab, I'll never do that again. You didn't like that. I didn't like it. <laughs> because up until that moment, I hadn't realized I was getting old. <laughs> and then you spoke. You, 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 you popped the bubble. You burst. You popped the bubble. So um, this is a study that uh, we did recently. Um, well, it's actually the master's uh, uh, master's work of this gal. She went back to Switzerland and ended up getting married and having a baby. And I went on to do some more work with her data. And what this was looking at was looking at gender differences in postural stability. Now, postural stability uh, develops over the ages of, from the time you start standing, and doesn't fully develop until arguably you're 14 or 15 years old. And in part, the early development of it comes around because each of the sensory systems mature at different rates. Uh, and so these kids were uh, 8 to 12 year old kids in New Zealand. And that's about the age where the three sensory systems are very nearly uh, mature. Uh, and uh, there's uh, some documented evidence from several studies saying that girls are further along that maturation process than boys. We didn't set out to test never whether that was true. We just wanted to examine some other ways of kind of perturbing the system. So what the kids did, uh, after their control was simply standing on a normal hard surface, i.e. a force platform and just looking straight ahead. The two other conditions were eyes closed, head back. So you would close their eyes and tilt their head back, so that would kind of distort our vestibular and take away our vision. So presumably this is mostly proprioception. And then eyes, um, eyes open, but standing on what they call a compliant surface. It was about uh, six or eight inches of soft foam on top of the force plate. Uh, and uh, we, we did a bunch of interesting stuff with it. We, we looked at some variables which were already in the literature. This is the center of pressure half velocity, looking at the, during the, the uh, 60 second trial, what the, the overall or the average velocity of the, of the uh, center of uh, pressure. This is the center of pressure uh, uh, radial displacement. So looking at uh, drawing uh, 
at each moment in time drawing a, a line back to the center and just seeing how the radial displacement changed and finally um, this is the area velocity. So looking at the, the velocity of the center of pressure and, and uh, uh, its area and how it, how it was changing through the, the, uh, the trials. And what we found was um, uh, for the path velocity there was there were really no differences, there was no, no change in these different things from control. Uh, we did find that the radial displacement and the uh, area velocity changed and, and significantly so between boys and girls here. And what we concluded is that, um, you know, as I said, previous research showed that girls were more mature in normal standard <coughs> postural responses. Uh, our data showed that that, that, that that was also true in our normal cases that girls did perform better than guys. But that um, where there's more novel tasks like um, eyes closed, uh, in a compliant surface, or eye, uh, or the head back, um, uh, eyes open, compliant, eye, eyes closed, compliant, uh, uh, head back, that the boys uh, actually performed better. And we we felt that it wasn't necessarily, it, it was actually a, a function of the girls' better, much more matured system in that they, they still uh, had not learned how to integrate the systems as well. So they were further developed, but they weren't fully integrated. Whereas the boys didn't have the choice, and so by not having choice, they just stuck. They just stuck to what they were already doing, and it, and it actually kept them closer to their control. Um, so in typical of life, boys just blundering ahead without knowing what they're doing, and girls overthinking. So, that's really so gender difference may be also <laughs> gender difference may be more related to factors other than gender. For instance, the body mass or BMI. Uh, and that it may, it may in children's uh, studies may actually be mis, uh, mis, uh, or misdiagnosed or misconcluded as being gender differences when in fact it's really a question of mass or BMI um, uh, instead. Did you guys look at that We simply uh, measured it and in our groups there was no statistical difference between them in terms of mass and BMI but we're just su uh, suggesting that maybe it's masking. It's appearing like gender differences, and in fact, it may be mass differences that really play the more important role. Because most of the girls were smaller than the guys, uh, you know, the differences may be more mass related than actual gender. Did you have any kind of data on activities? What boys were doing? Physical activities were, were about equal. About equal. Good question. But yeah, yeah. We, we, we did take a physical activity questionnaire to them, and there was no difference between this, this particular group of kids. We thought that might be some of the two. What well, is New Zealand? I mean, the kids are always out and about running around. It's not like Hong Kong or something. Really uh, okay, so so active mechanisms. Uh, talking too long now. Uh, reflexes are involuntary, and we have some voluntary control. Um, uh, latency. So we, we, if, if we're looking at the, the sort of the involuntary control, what we're talking about is latency of about 50 milliseconds. In other words, for us to to a stretch reflex. In other words, is about 50 milliseconds. Uh, so, the, the thing is that what we're finding, as I'll show you in a minute, is that we're finding that the center of pressure and the center of gravity are actually almost in phase. The difference between the center of pressure of motion and the center of gravity is about 4 milliseconds, 4 to 6 milliseconds, much faster than reflexes. So, the question then is, can we, can our central nervous system somehow predict, okay, well the center of mass is going to be there in, in, in 40 milliseconds, so I'm going to activate these muscles now in anticipation? Or is it something else? Well, this seems like an, like an unnecessarily complicated way to handle standing up, considering how much we do. Um, so there may be a more passive answer, and that is joint stiffness. So the muscles, we know they're viscoelastic. We know they have the capability of storing energy, so we know they act like springs, um, what you might call tuned springs, because we can actually change the stiffness of them. Uh, so, and stiffness then, just, just to remind yourself from grade 11 physics, stiffness is the slope of the force displacement curve, okay? Or in our case, torque angle. Okay, so, so the question is, is it sufficient to maintain balance during quiet standing? So think of the possibilities. If we didn't have to worry about standing quietly, uh, in terms of we didn't have to have any kind of uh, descending influence from the, uh, from the central nervous system, you could just kind of assess, okay, this is safe, this floor is not going to move, nobody's going to jump me here. I'm just going to set my stiffness at, you know, six, six, 
and just stand here. I mean, like the advantages to us are enormous. Zero energy cost virtually, no attention demand, and so forth. So that is what uh, Winter proposed in 1998. So this was uh, published about four years after he spoke to our group in Toronto. And um, he said a relatively simple that he experimentally derived and validated it. And basically, the center presser would oscillate uh, almost in phase with the center of gravity, about four milliseconds. So it was just like a spring. In other words, if, if, if you push, push uh, that, if, if, if you had a pendulum like that with a couple springs on it and you pushed it, the spring would stretch, the force would go up, when you released it, it, it would just pull the mass back into the vertical. And that's pretty much what he found. Experimentally, uh, Swadeater matched the model predicted, so he predicted, he used the model to predict, he got experimental data, and matched the model. It was a great study, I thought it was a real, real, a real beater. Interestingly enough, it, it generated a whole flurry of responses, most of them quite negative, to the idea that um, something as simple as a spring, uh, a, like a spring, could be controlling such a complicated kind of mo movement. And, they talked about how the physics of standing could be produced uh, from his data without using any of these spring constants and so forth. And of course, Dave Winter never, never uh, refused a fight, so he published a couple more papers where he had, he had replies to all of their, their concerns and, and so forth. And unless you were really interested in that area, you probably wouldn't have really noticed that it was going on. But it was quite a little battle going on. In the end, um, this um, whole... Um, Thing, uh, they went back and forth, there was a whole group of them went back and forth, and it was, it was quite uh, confusing to me, and I had to do a lot of reading to understand all this, but uh, I don't know why it doesn't fit. These guys actually built an inverted pendulum. Uh, it, it, was, it was connected to a subject who was standing, and they, and they actually got the pendulum to act just like the person, where they actually measured the stiffnesses that were necessary, and concluded that we couldn't possibly stand up. Uh, which, I mean, it was just, just muscle stiffness. Anyway, um, so it's gone back and forth ever since, uh, up until like, you know, even recent times. And what's happened to the whole idea of, st of stiffness is that they acknowledge that stiffness is an important part of the control mechanism, but it's probably not as important as Dave Winter first thought. Uh, it's, you know, it's been relegated to one of the more minor aspects of the whole stiffness model. And, and at one time, the slide had three or four alternative models. I figured you wouldn't be interested in that. Take my word for it. It's there somewhere, but it's not nearly as important as, as I thought it was in Dave as well. <coughs> and so this bothered me a bit. Now, I had a lot of data on standing, uh, and I thought, well, I'm going to start to kind of mine this data and see what I can find in it. Because one of the points that came out of all these other papers other than Dave Winters was that they, they always claimed that the stiffnesses they calculated were never enough to overcome the, the natural tendency of the person to fall. In other words, my natural tendency to fall, there's a certain torque I must produce to stop myself from falling on the basis of my weight and where my center of mass is. And so their data, Dave's, winter, Dave's data always was above that. A lot of their data was never high enough. Everything in my data set is always high enough. It's always enough. It's always sufficient. So I don't know what the issue is. So I got really kind of, kind of got in my skin a bit because Here's my logic. I wanted to look at a different way of calculating the stiffness. And that is, if angle joint stiffness is calculated from the, the, the angle joint moment and the sway angle of the body, and both signals are time series, then it would make sense to calculate stiffness like a time series, like a joint angle, like a joint moment. In the past, even in Dave's model, it's one number. For the entire trial, you calculate Essentially, because it's, it's, it's a regression model, you just regress the data and you get one number, one stiffness for the entire trial. And that's where I think the rub is, because I found that uh, studies that had longer trials, 90 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, 120 seconds, always their stiffness values were well below the sort of cutoff. Shorter trials, 20 and 30 seconds, were always above. So there seemed to be a systematic bias towards longer trials because of this one number being regressed across more and more data. So I thought, okay, uh, why not suggest a new way to calculate joint stiffness and see if we could bring this back into uh, what I think is an important aspect of, of standing, uh, the control of quiet standing. And so one of what we did was uh, we, we looked at 20 seconds of, of sway data. 
It happened to be data that was collected at 120 hertz, so there was that many, you know, 20 seconds times 120. I also tested it on, on data that was calculated at 60 hertz and found the same results, but it's not in this, this data set. So, and within that, we would then calculate joint stiffness across the entire trial and get one number, just like all the other papers. But then what we did was we, we looked at different windows of calculation. We took uh, 0.25 of a second, calculated the stiffness, moved it forward one frame, calculated, moved it forward, calculated. So you end up with, I don't know what that number was, I forget, like, like 2,000 values. And then you would go 0.5 of a second, slide it along, one second, two seconds, five seconds, and 10 seconds, different windows. So what did we find? Well, this is the, uh, uh, these are the results in the AP and the ML directions. Let me just explain this. So 1.0 here is representing what they call the gravitational spring. That's the minimum stiffness in, in, in the ankle you have to have to not fall over. So anything above 1 means you have enough stiffness and you won't fall. Anything less means that if all you had was stiffness, you, you would probably fall over. So that's, that's this line going across here. And you can see that with Virtually all, all values are, in fact, just, in these cases, just slightly above 1. So in every single case of measurement, I could show that there was sufficient angle stiffness to hold these subjects up, and there were 19 of them. Um, these are the windows. This is 0 0.25, uh, 0 0.5, uh, 1, 2, 5, 10, and then the, uh, the, uh, the 20 second. Uh, this is the, uh, the range. And the R squared here, because we're talking about a spring, and as you know, the spring is a, is a linear kind of thing, it's force over displacement, the R squared tells us how close are our data to a straight line. So an R squared of 1.0 means every data point falls along that, that, that straight line. And then, of course, uh, an R squared of 0 means that you know, they're just all over the place. And interestingly enough that, um, these two, which are significantly different from all the rest, um, have among the, the, the lower R squared. So in other words, the data are more, more randomly distributed, but they actually produce the highest stiffness values. Whereas the ones out here, which is more typical of what's being published, um, are much closer to a, to a straight line. Um, and when you see the next thing, you understand why. This is what the data look like if you do it every, if you take, if you calculate every quarter of a second and then slide it over one frame and one frame, one frame. So you can see that there's quite a random change in the, in the stiffness values. And sometimes it falls below the gravitational spring, but for the most part it sits above. This is the uh, 0.5. This is the 1, which is what we're recommending, one second intervals. We should, we should calculate over one second. Uh, this is the uh, 2, 5, uh, uh, sorry, the, this is the, the 1, 2, uh, 5, and this is the 10. And the solid line just shows the, the single 20, 20 second value as our sort of template, and the other line is our gravitational spring. So what, what does this look like? Well, what you can see very clearly is that the, if you just sort of look at what's of the averages here and here and here, you can see that there's a, there's a convergence of the averages, and that the, that, the, that the longer the trial is, the more it starts to approach this, this, uh, this uh, gravitational spring. And you might be able to then say, well, what if we did a 60 second trial, 90, 120, you can see that this whole motion with a single value would begin to dip down probably below that. And that's why papers with long ones have a, have a number which said we can't stand, and why papers with short ones say we can. So we're recommending that, uh, that people adopt this method of turning it into a time series signal, that we look at one second windows. As I said, it wasn't affected by the frame rate. Because in 60 second, 60 hertz dot trials, uh, the one second interval came out on top as well as the 120 hertz trials. So it's really not a function of how, how you have sampled the data. It's really a question of the actual time over which you, you calculate the stiffness itself. Probably something to do with the neural control of, of it, or I don't know what it is exactly. Why one second works out so well, but it seems to do that. Future research. I think it's not a model. Well, it could be. It could be. It probably needs a lot more sophisticated thinking on it than I can bring to bear. But uh, I want to look at the robustness of this. Because this was just, in fact, they, these were su subjects who, who were standing for 30 seconds. And then they're also part of a data set on gate initiation. So I had them stand for, for 30 seconds. 
uh, of which I took the middle 20, and then I instructed them to start walking. So I've also, I've also got another paper of, of the initiation of these same subjects. But I wanted to see the transition between this sway, 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 and sway, oh, now I'm going to move. Because that's what really interests me, this transition, because there's lots of people, Parkinson's disease patients, for instance, who can't make that transition. Maybe there's something in here that can help them. Anyway, so I want to look at that. So I'm looking at quiet standing, and this is coming to the RB, by the way. Uh, quiet standing with conditions of altered vision, that is open and closed eyes, uh, base of support, single versus two legs, and sway. I'm going to actually get subjects to try and not sway, try and be conscious of their sway and minimize it. And I'm going to ask the same subjects to try and sway right out to the tip of their toes and right to the back of their heels and just see if you know, what those conditions, whether this one second rule holds across a wide range. Uh, also looking at just the single support phase of walking and running. It'd be interesting to see how the stiffness works there. Uh, this one is in front of the IRB at the moment, still waiting for an outcome, but uh, uh, changes in gait dynamics during planned and unplanned turns. Idea being to look at people with chronic ankle injuries, for instance. But starting out with looking at some normal as well. Uh, and also this uh, initiation and termination. That first study I talked about had uh, 19 subjects who stood for 30 seconds and then just uh, stepped forward. Uh, this time I have a group of 20 subjects who did uh, normal gait, did uh, initiation and termination. So I've kind of got the, the whole spectrum and I'm working on, uh, on, on those data now. So, sorry, took a little longer, but thank you very much and I'm happy to answer any questions. But, yes, sure. How does this data translate to actually dynamic movement, like turning and activity? Because most of it's static, right? So is there... Well, let me just, before I answer, let me just say I forgot to give the answer to my question at the start. Why is it so hard to stand still? The answer is we, we, we're not ever still. And so that's it's kind of a, it's a no answer to that question. Uh, we don't know, and that's why I, I, I want to do this. No one's ever really looked at stiffness that way because the, the issue is when you're walking, um, like when you're standing, we're sort of treating it as though you've got a single ankle and you're just swaying back and forth, right? So it's quite contained. As soon as you start walking, and in our lab, say you've got one foot on the first plate or another one on the second one, now we've got two different things going on. So the only part of that you can really apply our methodology to is the point where one foot comes off the ground in preparation for the next step. So while the person is in what they call swing phase on the contralateral limb, we can measure the stiffness on the ipsilateral limb. And we can do that during during walking, but the trouble is the phases are very short. You know, uh, so that's that's a bit of a challenge because our, our methodology depends on we you know having a little more data, but we can still try it. And on the other case that uh, you're making turns, you know, we can look at that too. So that's what I hope to incorporate into those turn studies and so forth. Yeah. Along those same lines, would dynamic activities that are bilaterally similar, like a sit to stand, would your model fit that better than something that's unilaterally? Sure, sure. As, as soon as the, the buttocks get up off the chair and they're now putting like, all their forces through a single force play, yeah, we can certainly model stiffness in that, in that sense, yeah. Yeah, hi. I actually have, I have two questions, and given the audience, these will probably be stupid questions. No, no. there are no stupid it's questions, just stupid answers. answers. I know, I know, I knew, I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> but questions, just to read the questions, questions that most members of the audience um, are knowledgeable. Of. Um, so they are. Why is there such a range of um, imbalance in otherwise healthy people who are not obese, and why does why does that other than well, I'll answer this, but I think the second question first, and I think the balance becomes compromised in aging because the, the sensory systems are deteriorating at different rates. And, and I think that we all have experienced that when we were kids, you know, I mean, like when we were kids, like we loved being on the, uh, the, spinny, the spinny thing, whatever that was. You know. and, 
and, and now the thought of even watching someone makes me sick in my stomach, right? So we know that there's some changes going on there. But Gail has a great answer here. I can, I can use the math. Well, no, no, no. I mean, you, you, when you talk about, you're talking about the physiology being right. changed. And all right. systems start to decline. Right. So and they decline at hugely different rates, depending on how well they're used. And how well they're used, not just in childhood, but they continue to be used. So people who become sedentary have a much faster rate of decline than those people. And all the systems that Drew talked about all are declining at different rates. And the one piece that he didn't mention in terms of the, the balance piece that we, we kind of always talk about too is that central integration piece that takes all the sensory information, figures out what to do with it, and then sends those signals out to the motor side. And that piece also is declining. So and it is going to decline based on that individual's activity right. and their pathology and <clears throat> there's just so many things that can affect it. And as far as your first question, why is there such a wide variability? I'm not really sure specifically what variability you're in. That there's a wide range of um, ability, ability yeah. and balance among people who otherwise are based, are otherwise healthy, the same yeah. the same physical activity level. So you know. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, when we used to test, uh, you know, people in Hong Kong in our lab on this this balance metric. I mean. The protocol is to wear a harness, and you wouldn't think that the relatively small movements that go on in this thing, and the fact that I was testing people all under the age of 25, that we would ever need that. And yet, regularly, mm -hmm. kids who are on sports teams, they're athletic. Yes. Uh, this system would, would fool them, and they would they would they would lose they would lose control of their balance. And so, for el for older people, it, it happens quite regularly. I remember when we first showcased the same equipment in Hong Kong back in 2000. And about, about 1999, we had the president of the university come in for this, you know, dog and pony show, and had him in the harness, and you know, it was a little embarrassing. He fell over on the first trial. <laughs> so, yeah. so I guess that's always my question. I was just wondering that has has the the, the, the evidence already established one cause of high propensity to fall, and it hasn't. That's why you study. And well, I mean, yeah. I mean, my, my people are attacking it from a ton of different angles. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Because, and even, because, like, even when you're studying about the ankle stiffness, it has not fully established a tight correlation between stiffness and fall. You just study not, not entirely, but, but here's something rather interesting. Is, and this story is still anecdotal. The, the, the study that I, uh, that I talked about um, here, uh, except for this exaggerated sway, I, I've done a small study like this, I did it in England. And um, I, I happen to have a couple of faculty members as subjects who, who just happen to be in the later stages of their career, shall we say. And one of, one of them um, uh, just really couldn't even do a, a 30 second trial of two legged standing with their eyes closed. And the one legged standing, the most data I got out of her was about eight seconds. But interesting enough, her. You would think that, okay, if, if I'm going to be a, a, a bit fearful or concerned about falling under a novel situation like eyes closed and one leg, whatever, that I might tend to want to stiffen up, right? I want to be more stiff. Right. Well, what we found is that the more challenging conditions in this group, and again, it's only a small group, mostly young people, that when the eyes were closed and they were on one leg, their stiffness values were at the lowest that they produced. They were actually the lowest. <laughs> Well, you would think that intuitively you'd think that they'd do one of you because know, you're, you're apprehensive and stuff. And that may be a bit of an answer as to why people do fall when they're older, because they're apprehensive. Having a lower stiffness value, really, what does that mean? It means that you will allow yourself to displace more before you, you come to a failure point, which means you have more time to assess how, much, how big is this perturbation, am I going to fall, and you, you have time to add, this is my theory, that you have a little more time to, to engage some kind of corrective response. If you're very stiff, then you resist, you resist, and then you go. There's just no, no, almost no time between the perturbation and the failure point. That's my theory. I'm hoping that this study will begin to point in the direction of whether, I mean, if the, if the same trend happens here, where you have this, because these are going to be in combination. So there'll be, a, there'll be a condition where they do this, with this, and with this. 
Okay, so he's exaggerating this way, their eyes are closed, and they're on a single leg. And if their stiffness values consistently across this group are the lowest, then I think it adds a little more uh, evidence to the sort of theory I have that, you know, you want lower stiffness. So what do we do with that? We take elderly or older people who have a fall, but have a fear of falling, we train them to be less stiff. And how do you do that? Well, you put them in a safe environment, and you perturb them. You put them in an environment where they know they're not going to hurt themselves. You put them in a, in a, in a harness, uh, and, and you teach them how to pick up the signals of, first off, losing balance. But they have no trouble, you know, kind of, kind of getting that. But knowing how far can I go before I really am in trouble. I don't know, that's just my theory. Yeah. But, but, you know, this is just really one factor. What I realized, I think when I came in here, I just really wanted to know, is there one thing that I can do? It's just multiple factors. Yeah, yeah. So it's, many, it's even psychologically, the, 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 the idea of fear. Yeah. Uh, even you have all the other components. There's, there's, there's a whole bunch of papers on fear of falling, yeah. even among younger people. And this one guy at the University of Waterloo, uh, who was there after I left, yeah. he used to test people on doing this standing balance um, you know, on, at ground level, and then he would take them up about a, a meter and a half. Yeah. Young people, yeah. totally different response, yeah. completely different response. Right. They were perfectly safe, you know, it was all, you know, ethics was all done, and we were all perfectly safe, but just the idea that they're 1.5 meters off the ground, the re the re the responses were totally different. I, I do have one response to it, to stay active. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know what, I keep challenging I've been falling all my life. But now I'm older and more worried about my fall. Because so I'm you're going to get more physically active. Oh, I'm very physically active. I do dancing and we do all the That's why I thought... Wear, we did, wear yeah. thicker clothing. <laughs> no, I don't think that. No, I just thought I was thinking that maybe there's one. One, you know, one stay magic. Active. There's no magic. Stay no active. magic. No magic. No magic. No magic. But what I like about this stiffness thing, though, is is that it's very simple. And, you know, the body uh, often has these uh, elegantly simple ways of doing things. And it just appeals to me that stiffness is much more important than what, what the current literature, you know, says. And I think a little bit of that was personality-based. People either liked my supervisor or they didn't like him. <laughs> just ask Jacqueline Perry. I just mean, yeah, Jack and Perry and Dave Winter used to go at each other all the time. Oh, so. yeah. You didn't think much of her, but she thought much of me. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just thinking of in terms of working with students or in a clinical setting, in a, in a community setting, so they're not in a acute care theater. Yeah. And they're working with a population who don't have access to sure. kind of a balance training that we're talking about. That in terms of Yes. Okay. So stay active. But are there actual yes, there types? Are. You know, it seems like well, well, there are things that like, on one leg. That's right. Yes, yes, it does. There's no doubt that that's what we're doing. That's another conversation. Well, there's there's no doubt that there are very clearly defined risk factors for older people, and and if you look at this activity is all built into it because. You know, one of the main ones is lower limb muscle strength. Yeah. And of course, if you're sedentary, you're losing that all the time. So staying active is very important, especially doing things where you're working against against gravity. Yes. So going so up, like, you, just using body weight to do yes. things. I mean, that's, that's the best exercise, walk. Is, to, is to do things. Walk, walk stair fast. climb. Yep, yep. And, and, you know, so, and, and just you know, do things to maintain uh, whatever ability you have. Not to try and stop it from going back. You don't have to join a gym. You don't have to, you know, yeah, I mean, run a marathon a, or something. Know, the, the physical, in terms of the populations that we work with, what's actually accessible? The best thing, I think, walking. Get them to walk as much as they can. Avoid cars whenever they can. If they take public transportation, get off at the next stop and walk back to your place. I mean, just simple things. Take dance lessons. Yes. Take the stairs instead of a uh, oh, lift or but you know, but it Or even on an escalator, walk up the escalator. Oh, I always walk up the escalator. Yeah. I mean, Hong Kong's full of escalators. They, yes. I've seen escalators in Hong Kong that are about five steps high. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. There, and in some places, you can only take an escalator. There's no option to take the stairs. So I always take. I always walk up the escalators. Always. Got to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.